And I want to talk about or start our discussion of poroelasticity. So up until this point in the class, we've assumed that all of the kinematics, the stresses, and strains were all governed by simply the deformation of the solid material. But we know that geomaterials, uh, typically, uh, certainly the type of geomaterials we're interested in in petroleum engineering, are saturated with some type of fluid, right? And we'll develop our, we'll kind of, you know, have our initial discussion. Well, we'll just assume that the material is fully saturated with some fluid. So you can think that it's water um, or, or, you know, oil or whatever. But it's going to be a single phase fluid, uh, basically fully saturating a, a solid material, solid porous material. And so just some reminders. If you remember, uh, uh, we talked about pressure a little bit there when we were talking about plasticity, but let's just remember that we can decompose our stress tensor into the deviatoric part plus the hydrostatic part. And another way to write it is the deviatoric part minus the pressure times sigma ij, where the pressure is equal to minus one-third sigma kk. And the minus sign is just a convention because typically when we talk about solid materials, we assume that uh, ten tensile stresses are positive and compressile stresses are, are negative. Okay. So with that in, in mind, Let's consider a solid block that's under hydrostatic stress. And we're just going to label the, I mean, we know that the stress state in, in the rock, uh, as it's drawn here, would be equal to, because I'm saying it's hydrostatic, uh, it would be equal to this term up here. So we'll just go ahead and label it P. And as I've drawn it, this is, you know, positive, this is compression, right? So now let's assume that our rock is actually not solid, but is porous. So we'll draw some representative pores here. Of course, in reality, the pores would be much smaller much, much smaller. The area of the pores would be much, much smaller than our sort of uh, dx type distances here of our hypothetical continuum rock. But each of these pores is fully saturated with some fluid uh, that provides an equilibrium pressure to the rock or to the solid. I'm not really specializing to say that it has to be a rock. So there's some fluid pressure internal to the rock that's applying a hydrostatic stress, okay? And, or an, an, let's just say a, a pore pressure that's applying a stress that's in, that allows the rock to be in equilibrium, or the solid, the solid to be in equilibrium. And so with that, we can say that, I mean, if you consider You know any little patch within this solid, we know that it's going to be under a hydrostatic stress that's equal to minus p delta i j, and that's because you know our total stress tensor is the deviatoric stress plus the pressure, but in this case there's no deviatoric stress. This is under an equilibrium hydrostatic stress. Okay? And if you remember, we, for an isotropic material, right, we had this constitutive model that's like um, lambda 
sigma kk delta ij plus 2 mu sigma ij, right? But if you remember, we, we also uh, defined a bunch of identities that related LeMay's constant to other things. And so if we choose the one that relates LeMay's constant uh, to the bulk modulus and the shear modulus, or the second LeMay's constant, so then if we plug that guy in, we'll have k minus 2 third mu sigma kk sigma ij plus 2 mu sigma ij, right? Epsilon ij, rather. Uh, that is k epsilon kk ij. I'm going to write this a little bit special way. I'm going to write 2 mu 1 third epsilon kk sigma ij plus 2 mu sigma ij. And I write that so that you can see that, that the 2 mu can be factored. Right? So I have k epsilon kk sigma ij minus 2 mu plus 2 mu epsilon ij minus 1 third epsilon kk sigma ij, right? Well, we can recognize this as the deviatoric strain tensor, right? And if there's no deviatoric stress, there's no deviatoric strain. So this guy is zero, and our constitutive model reduces to this, okay? But we also know that uh, this guy is true, so we can plug that in. Sigma ij's will cancel each other, and this implies that epsilon kk is equal to minus p over k. And now I'm going to just, just to be clear, I'm going to say that ks, so this is the k of the solid material, because if you remember we derived it uh, by trying to consider, you know, what what state of stress some block internal to the solid here would look like, okay? And so sigma kk is uh, minus the pressure over the bulk modulus of the solid, okay? Now, we know that's true, so this is the volumetric strain, right? So if we know the volumetric strain, we know that the total strain tensor is equal to the deviatoric strain plus one-third the volumetric strain, sigma ij, right? We said earlier there's no deviatoric strain, so that's equal to zero. So the total strain tensor is equal to plugging in our known relationship for the volumetric strain minus P over K solid divided by 3 delta IJ. All right, so that's the total strain tensor for that little piece of equilibrated solid material in our hypothetical poroelastic medium, all right? So with that, let's think about the general case, a general stress tensor we know obeys Hooke's law, right? So sigma ij is equal to C i j k l epsilon k l. And we haven't shown this before, but this is an invertible relationship, so we might write that sigma KL, I say we haven't shown it before, we haven't shown it for the generalized Hooke's Law. We have done these inversions, uh, you know, for the specialized case of isotropic materials and, 
I think in the playing strain and playing stress case, we've certainly shown it. But we might might write that this is D K L I J sigma I J, where D is basically the inverse of C, and that another way to write that is that I J K L D M N O P is equal to I M J N K O L P. And this is a fourth order identity tensor. So for an arbitrary stress state and pressure, pressure now being a you know a fluid pr uh, pressure, or you might you might think of this as uh, you know, for an arbitrary deformation to the solid, to the to the total structure, that causes some stress, and either due to flow or the stress-induced pressure change, that this is the the fluid pressure that changes due to that arbitrary deformation. The strain tensor would then be, and I'm just going back up here. And I'm saying that this is KL IJ times some arbitrary stress plus some arbitrary pressure. Okay, so that's the strain, and and I want to I want to be clear that this these constants are the constants associated with the fluid field structure. So these are the constants that would be measured if you had a completely saturated sample and you underwent some to some sort of uh, you know standard testing to derive those elastic constants from experiments these would be the constants that are measured while this structure has fluid in it okay so it's not just the solid media okay so you'd have this term okay but you know this is strain so this is the this this whole thing would be the strain associated with stresses and fluid pressures in the drain material but that's equilibriated in the solid material in the solid kind of skeleton by those volumetric strains that we derived earlier these guys right So we have to subtract out those strains, okay? And so this, the total strain of the of the fluid-filled structure, is the strain that you'd measure the, the strain that you'd measure in an experiment, or the stress you know due to the stresses and fluid pressures that are produced, minus those internal stresses to this to the solid skeleton strains to the solid skeleton, okay? And so with this idea, it's useful now to introduce something that we'll call an effective stress. So I'll use sigma prime for that. Sigma prime is an effective stress. And that effective stress is going to be the stress plus alpha p, alpha is just a constant, times the pressure times sigma ij, okay? And that is going to be equal to c i j k l epsilon k l, where this c i j k l is the inverse of d k l i j, so therefore it inherits those same properties in that this is the elasticity tensor associated with 
doing experiments of a saturated porous media. Okay? And so with that, we'll plug in our relationship here. So we have C I J K L times D K L I J sigma I J plus P sigma I J minus one over three K S P sigma K L. Okay, let's see what we can do some simplification here. Let's just look at this term real quick. I mean, this is, as I said before, this would be I K J L K I LJ. And when you multiply that by sigma IJ, you can show that it just simplifies to sigma IJ. All right. Let's see here. This parenthesis should be here. So in front of this term, you're going to have a, a very similar, uh, sim similar sim simplification. So you're going to get plus P delta IJ minus. C I J K L over three K S P delta K L. All right. And that is equal to Sigma I J plus alpha P delta I J. Sigma I J's cancel. You can see in the terms that are left, all the, the all of them have a p in them, so we can cancel those. Okay. And then what I'm going to do now is I'm going to multiply all the remaining terms by sigma i j. Sorry, delta i j. So I'm just multiplying every term by delta i j. Well, delta ij, delta ij is 3. You can verify that. Right. So what we end up with is 3 alpha equal to 3 plus delta ij, c i j, k l, delta k l all over 3ks. All right, so then if we divide by 3, right, and this is 1, 1, and this is 9. And so therefore, what we end up with is alpha equal to 1 minus delta ij, c i j, k l, delta k l, all over 9 k s, and for an isotropic material, we can show that delta ij is equal to c i j, k l, delta k l over 9 is equal to 9 lambda plus 6 mu over 9. And that is a equal to the bulk modulus T. Which, so this is the total bulk modulus. So this is the bulk modulus measured of a saturated porous media. Okay, And so therefore, alpha is equal to 1 minus KT over KS. Right, so that's the ratio of the bulk module. So this thing is called Biot's coefficient, named after Maurice Biot, 
who formalized this idea of effective stress. And we can see that if the bulk modulus of the solid um, is much, much larger than the effective bulk modulus, then alpha tends towards 1. And you know this is true for, for like soils or sort of unconsolidated soils, would, would this would be true. Um, for rocks and concrete, this is not true. And it's not untypical to see an alpha on the order of two thirds. And so again, just remember our effective stress is equal to the total stress plus alpha times the fluid pressure times sigma ij. Okay? So this is the, introduces the, this is kind of our first lesson in poor elasticity, and we covered the derivation of Biot's coefficient and the concept of effective stress.